The Ryan Jesperson Show, weekday mornings at 9 on 630 Chad. Our thanks to Danny Braun and uh, for what I think was uh, probably an enlightening conversation for a lot of folks and certainly an interesting one. The entrepreneur, uh, one of the three partners uh, alongside Edgar Gutierrez and Chris Sills behind Rostasado and Trace Carnales. Isn't it interesting, friends, when you hear actual numbers of how businesses are being impacted by legislation and wage changes and parking bans and all those types of things? And certainly for a lot of you, I think that was an informative exercise. For us, it was very cool to see an interaction, an organic interaction of sorts between two entrepreneurs we have in our bullpen our three panelists returning the world of water panel uh jay white andre aslan and Corey chillebeck and we'll do proper introductions in just a moment but to the three of you welcome back to chorus hey, thanks for having us back man yeah. Corey, you're just back from from edmonton you, you, edmonton's airport you just flew in yeah. a, a, a work trip work to trip. japan and korea Japan-Korea. and there's danny yeah. braun who's uh, one of your clients he's one of the restaurants a partner that's carrying earth water and he goes oh i've been meaning to call you we need we he need was more. upset he was, he was understandably <laughs> upset I he says everybody wants the water and we've run out. Yeah, he's run out and he couldn't get a hold of me and I, I apologize. And so you had an impromptu business meeting in, in the bullpen right here at Chorus floor, Radio. Yeah, yeah, made a sale. It was good. Well, I got my my customer back. I was worried. He you was got your bit, customer uh, back. Yeah, yeah. And my commission is a very reasonable 15%, I'll, uh, I'll Corey. I'll drop some off for you next week. So there you have it. Corey, you're the CEO, the president and founder of Earth Group of Companies uh, and Earth Water, which I think many people are familiar with, is the only product, as far as I know, or one of a very select few that has the actual UN, United Nations, stamp on it. You bet, yeah. We work directly with the United Nations World Food Program, and it's on the front of Earth Coffee, Earth Water, and Earth Tea, our, our products that we make here in Edmonton. And uh, we give 100% of the net profits from the sale of everything we sell all around the world to uh, provide food, water, and education to the poorest children in the world. And There's no asterisk there. It's actually 100%, 100% of your profits. 100% of net. And this year, we this past year, we fed 800,000 children, and our goal this year will be about 1.2 million if we can hit our marks. Unbelievable. Uh, sitting next to you is Jay White. Jay is the principal of Equality in environmental consulting welcome back thanks for having us ryan you're you're like bouncing in your chair you've got so many things to get to <laughs> wait a few uh, things to chat about you morning. do not lack uh, either opinion nor knowledge which is a fabulous combo for talk radio and i'm going to turn the reins over to you in just a second and andre aslan back as well the senior manager with alberta water council andre welcome thank you they actually bumped me up they made me executive director now i wasn't oh, busy enough. congratulations well, thank you very much yeah you they probably saw you slack and they said well you should put more on his plate right there you well go. congratulations on the promotion. Andre, it's uh, Canada Water Week. This week starts on Thursday, I think, and people can check out CanadaWaterWeek.com. Why is it relevant to you? What do you hope people talk about this week? Canada Water Week's a great opportunity to get everybody talking and raising awareness of water issues and sort of getting a look at where the water's coming from. You've got various aspects of it from Corey and sort of where are we providing water from and, and how are we helping the poor and then Jay's sort of scientific aspect of it of what's happening to our water and what are we doing to it. And uh, my, my angle is a little bit of how are we all working together to try and reach outcomes that are positive for everyone. How are we working together well, or is there a lot of work to be done? Well, I think everyone realizes there's a lot of benefit to working together and approaching problems that we can solve together. So that's sort of what my organization does, the Alberta Water Council. Uh, it's working pretty well, I'd say. You know, we've been working with uh, industry and non-government organizations and municipalities and different levels of government to uh, to tackle a big uh, a lot of these big issues that are important to everyone. And uh, Canada Water Week and World Water Day, which is on Thursday, actually, is a great opportunity for that. And I'll plug uh, Yeg Water uh, is the website site is actually um, lining out what some events are happening at the uh, the Nate Shaw Amphitheater uh, on Thursday night. So uh, have a look at that, folks, and uh, look into it, see if you've uh, got some interest in attending. Jay, what do you hope or what do you expect people will be talking about or focusing on through Canada Water Week? What's most relevant or pertinent to us right now? I had the opportunity to speak to Inside Education last week in Canmore to teachers and students that were lucky enough to attend that session. And my big thing for the kids to all be aware of is when you turn your tap on, ask, where does that water come from? When you flush your toilet, ask yourself, where is that water going? And what are the impacts downstream? Well... Tell us. Oh, there's, there's, there's lots of things to be aware of. You know, downstream of the city of Edmonton and city of Calgary, we're going to find all sorts of nutrients in the water, sediment in the water. We're going to find, in roughly these proportions, caffeine, 
cotinine and carbamazepine. And the pharmaceutical suite that the province did recently confirmed these things, but downstream in major urban centers, you're going to find a whole host of uh, pharmaceutical products, personal care products, all those sort of things in trace amounts downstream from a major urban center. So if you're drawing your water downstream of Edmonton or Calgary, you're going to need some extra treatment on your water, or we're just going to ban, you know, taking of water, you know, 100 kilometers downstream from Edmonton. Which isn't really viable or it doesn't make sense for a lot of people, including those in ag, right? Right. No, that's absolutely uh, true. You know, we had a conversation the other day. It was specifically about uh, opioids and fentanyl uh, contamination of, yeah. of drugs like cocaine. And and I kind of just, I guess, to be honest, just flippantly or off the cuff said, listen, if you think basically that you've got fentanyl-laced cocaine, do yourself a favor and flush it down the toilet. And we got about... <laughs> I wish people could see your face right now. We got about, Ryan, we got Ryan, about Ryan. 20 Holy messages cow. in one minute, <laughs> and, and I'm fine to eat crow when I need to, or let me just say to circle back and correct, but I really appreciated the check that people held me to. People said, what are you talking about? Flush don't it down the toilet. Ever, yeah, don't ever flush anything other than, you know, your human human feces down the toilet. Uh, there are excellent drug programs for recycling, capturing all that stuff. Uh, any any res- responsible drugstore will take your unused meds back, so there's a program in the spring every year where they're asking for that back. All your your choppers, drug marts, and those sort of things will ask for that stuff back. But our wastewater treatment plants are not at all capable of of handling that load. So really, like three or four grams of cocaine, a negligible amount, would be enough to contaminate water? It would be enough. Uh, yes. Are you the uh, only one doing it, though? Yeah, you're not the only one doing it. I don't so think there's downst- a ton of people doing it. Downstream of the city of Calgary at Stampede, <laughs> you know, the, the loads of cocaine in the water is out, out of hand. But it's it's the impacts that it has at the wastewater treatment level as well, because there's b- bugs that live in the, the, the sludge there that do the digesting, and you don't want to throw cocaine at those guys. But that's not, that's not just even... <laughs> It's not even just pure <laughs> cocaine that you don't want to do throwing in the toilet. There's a whole bunch of pharmaceuticals and things that are not being absorbed by our bodies that are flushing right out that we, when you when you just go and urinate in the toilet, that that's coming out. So you're only absorbing a fraction of the actual pharmaceuticals and chemicals that you're taking in your body anyways. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's an issue that, as Jay spoke to about having... Um, knowledge about what's coming down the stream and where your water is coming from. It's as much an opportunity to think about where it's coming up the stream and what you can do to sort of manage and protect that water to, to reduce the impacts that are going into your water source in the first place. And you have to think of some place like the Mississippi River where there's several urban centers upstream of you. And so that water has on average gone through 20 different people before you're drinking it. That's kind of crazy to think about. The, the ooh factor is high, but... That, that's exactly what happens. I want to talk, and we'll circle back to River Health. We had the Environment Minister in not two hours ago mm. talking about uh, whirling disease, and I want your take on that, Jay, your informed take on that. But, but Corey, along the lines of, of Canada Water Week, and, and we'll be asking you about the safety of bottled mm. water again before the hour's up, uh, what do you hope that people focus on? What are you focusing on this week? You know what? A lot of it's gratitude, and it's understanding how lucky we are. I mean, I, I get the chance to travel over the world. I'm in almost 60 countries now, a lot of those, the poorest places in the world. Um, and one thing Thing that I always hear, even coming back just now from Korea and Japan, very you know, uh, forward countries with amazing technology, is that we're lucky. We have so much clean, fresh drinking water, and we need to protect it. We need organizations like some of the organizations in this room today just to do that, and we need to you know, focus on it as a country. I mean, uh, I'm the only guy who probably owns a bottled water company that says it's absolutely not necessary to drink bottled water in Canada. Don't do it unless you really want to. It's, it's a luxury product. I'll, I'll throw it out there. You just, just drink it if you have to. If you're going to buy bottled water, we want you to drink ours, but you don't need to. We have great, some of the best drinking water in the world. I mean, outside of some of our First Nations reserves where tragically there isn't clean drinking water and that needs to be addressed. That's another topic. We have great drinking water. Drink it out of the tap. You don't have to drink bottled water. But if you're going to, we just want you to choose our product over, you know, the Cokes and Pepsis and Nestle's of the world because we do some some different things, right? Do you, do all three of you just drink water right out of the tap? Absolutely. Yeah. Water actually, bottle in front of me is tap water. Yeah, yeah. This, this bottle of earth water in front of me, I've filled up three times for sure. Okay, so yeah. you're reusing the, the, yeah, the you container. Know, every day. Edmonton and Calgary yeah. have some of the best tap water in the world. In the world. In the world. Absolutely. And, and we feed communities all up and down with regional water systems so that we're, we're maximizing the efficiency of the dollars spent on water and wastewater treatment plants, right? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it, it's, it's a huge benefit, and I think a lot of people sort of get advertised into buying bottled water when they really don't need to. So Ed- Edmonton's Epcor's water goes upstream to Edson and downstream to Vegreville. Like Vegreville people are drinking City of Edmonton drinking water. Awesome. Regionalization. Yeah. And it's the same thing with the Calgary partnership as well. So we've gotten away from every small municipality having a, you know, tiny little water treatment plant and an operator to having these giant 
very industrial plants, lots of operators uh, that it can afford the nano filtration, uh, micro microbes to break down the nutrients, tertiary treatment, those sort of things. Then we'd ship it all over the province. Tiny Tim's listening in to 630-630 says, you know what? He says, guys, I've been filtering my water mm-hmm. uh, with top quality filtration systems, and now I can't even stomach unfiltered water. He says it's imp- also important to filter your shower water. He says water is our lifeblood and the most important part of our life. Yeah, he's not wrong. Water is the lifeblood and the most. But what about filtering water and filtering shower water? I mean, filtering comes down to smell and taste, yeah. really. I think it comes to, when it comes down to drinking water, you, you, if you're using an activated carbon system, uh, which is probably what probably what he's looking at, um, it's the kind of thing that uh, you can you can do if you like. But in terms of the safety of it and the cleanliness of it, uh, tap water is just fine right here in Alberta for the <laughs> most part. So, city of Edmonton. All, all, all of our municipal s- treatments, you can think of it as the plastic wrapper on a bag of bread. And we ship our water in the protect- protective plastic, which is chlorine. So that's the protective envelope that we use. And that's also the indicator that we can use to make sure that there's a disinfectant level that's adequate to make sure there's no fecal coliforms or other things in our water. So that's why water comes out smelling like chlorine. And some places smells worse than others. And a lot of people have an aversion to that, either that smell or the flavor. So they would use some sort of activated carbon or some other treatment, at-home treatment, to get rid of the chlorine. Chlorine, of course, will also dry out your skin. So that's probably where your your texture is coming in from. We want to make sure we filter, or they want to prefer that that uh, chlorine is removed before they shower in it, because it'll dry out your skin. If you've got psoriasis, that'll light your skin right up. Mm. Listener says uh, New Sarepta is drinking city water as well. There's probably a number of communities. Uh, We'll hit pause. When we come back with Jay White, Andre Aslan, Corey Chilebeck, I want to ask you, and and Jay, I guess this probably falls in your lap, at least initially, about whirling disease. I mean, it it sounds like a big deal, and if you're a fish, it probably is a big deal, but let's get into it when our World of Water Roundtable returns here on Ched. As part of Canada Water Week, we're thrilled to welcome back our World of Water Roundtable, Jay White, Principal at Equality Environmental Consulting, Andre Aslan, Executive Director at Alberta Water Council, and Corey Chilliback, CEO and founder of the Earth Group of Companies, including Earth Water. It's been amazing. Once we start talking about communities uh, outside Edmonton, they're using Edmonton's water. You should see how many are chiming in. Two Hills, Mundare, Willenden, etc. Pretty amazing. Paints a clear picture. Before we move on, you just said something that I guess it should have occurred to me, but it never really did. You're talking about a super Super Bowl commercial uh, for, for a certain brand of vehicle that uh, that I have quite an affinity to. I own two of them. I love them. I'm an off-roader. I'm a jeeper. You know this, Jay, but you're, you have steam coming out of your ears right now. How come? Well, we get into social license and responsibility, and we're seeing over and over these off-roader ads, and we've got in every single one somebody driving through a stream or a creek. And in this particular ad, really infuriated some folks with a Jeep driving through a creek and then finishing off its tour by going straight up a waterfalls and bragging about how great Jeeps are. And that's a problem because... Well, we don't want to get uh, sediment. You don't want to be driving in fish habitat. Of course, it's illegal to drive in the beds and shores of all water courses in Alberta, so that uh, also is against the law, so make sure you use bridges or dams or something like that, but you can't be willy-nilly crossing through water bodies like that. Do you think that there's a solution to be found with with off-road advocacy groups, uh, groups that love off-roading but also want to protect the environment, Mm -hmm. and the province, most notably, and potentially the feds, to participate in better education programs, the building of bridges, as opposed to just closing down off-road trails? Absolutely, and you see progr- programs like the Respect the Land that the province is doing. There's some, and there's some really great education and enforcement, like the enforcement. And compliance department is also all about education. So you'll find on those long weekends that you've got parks, not park staff, but you've got uh, fish and fisheries and fish and wildlife staff out in the green zone, educating folks, working with those RV groups, doing some of that education piece. And I think I think that they work very closely to make sure that we're not just closing trails, but making sure that there's responsible use in those areas and maybe closing use in some sensitive areas. Mike in Swan Hills with the Otaskiman number says, you know what, those guys, they'd get sick if we started talking about how much fresh water is shot down these oil wells for recovery and fracturing. There are visceral reactions right now here in studio, but I'm getting the impression that none of you actually want to talk about it. That's a big can of worms to talk about, Ryan. Well, there's... 
yes, okay, industry uses water, we get that. And uh, the oil and gas industry does use pretty significant volumes of water, but you also have to take into account where the water's coming from and what are the competing uses in the area, right? So a lot of the, a lot of the work that's happening that's heavily... Um, very intense water use is up north where there's there's a lot more water supply than there is people who need it. Um, recently, over the last 10 years, the oil and gas sector, through the Alberta Water Council process of developing uh, water conservation efficiency and productivity plans, uh, set a voluntary target to reduce the amount of fresh water they use by 24% and using saline water, which is unusable by any other uh, for any other purpose, essentially. So, uh, yes, water gets used for industri- industrial purposes. Sometimes it's pumped down a hole to do enhanced oil recovery. I think we all took some form of transportation to get here today. Uh, you know, Alberta runs on oil, Alberta drills oil. That's what we do. It's what we're good at. Um, but there are, you know, significant improvements in technology and process and legislation to try to minimize the amount of fresh water we're just pumping down holes. So yeah, it's an issue, but everyone's working on it. Isn't it true, though, that access to water will change your attitude on water? For example, if you're living here in northern Alberta, central to northern Alberta, and and supply is abundant, you have a different attitude than if you're in the Horn of Africa and you're hiking 20 kilometers one way to get hot water out of a well to bring back to your family. I mean, of course, the attitude's going to be different. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, that's life and death for people. We take water for granted here. We have tons of it. And unfortunately, we have to do our best to protect it. But the rest of the world, they they think we're crazy, to be honest, what we do here. Are we always going to have a healthy supply of water? We don't. Uh, We closed the South Saskatchewan Basin 10 years ago for any more surface water licenses because we recognized back then that we've allocated more water than actually is in the river. So we've closed that and now we've got a water market in the south where if somebody wants water, they've got to buy it from an existing licensee. So we're tied to this 100 plus year old system of first in time, first in right. And we've got 100 year old water licenses. So now if I need water, I'm going to have to buy it off a senior water holder as best that I can. So should we be blowing up these agreements as far as you can tell? That's something that one of these days is going to need to be considered. But the irrigation... Uh, the irrigation... uh, uh, Let me jump in. Sure. The the market approach of trading... Uh, water licenses is the the way to improve efficiency when it comes to using water for higher value purposes, right? So um, City of Calgary and the irrigation districts uh, have, the irrigation districts especially, have very large water allocations, right? And they grow all the food that feeds Canada and the world. So, you know, they need water for that. And it's a a great area of of the world to be growing food. So they need it. so, for example, uh, but but they're able to trade that water and make improvements to their own system to either grow more acres of food or feed it to communities, right? So the irrigation districts supply communities and processors, and they do jobs. Right? They support everything down there. So, um, was it the Cross Iron Mills Mall mm-hmm. needed water, and yep. they weren't? Yep. They didn't have a water license. Out of Balzac. This Out was a Balzac. very this controversial is, this story. Is a controversial deal, right? And people didn't understand that this is the purpose of the water market. These guys needed water to run their commercial operations, feed jobs, do all that stuff, and that. Uh, what they did is they paid one of the irrigation districts enough money that the irrigation district could close up one of its open canals and put it in a pipeline. So all the water that was saved by doing that pipeline move is enough water to feed the mall. So pausing Andre for two seconds is basically those canals are leaky. So there's water that's seeping down into the ground. Plus there's all the water that's transpiring into the atmosphere. They quantified that, realized that they lose this many meters cubed of water per year and they were able to sell that loss to the cross iron mills wow more on water i mean there's so much about water to talk about we haven't even got to the whole purpose of this panel yet and we'll refocus through these headlines and be right back with jay white andre aslan and Corey chillebeck 11.36 11.36 on this Tuesday morning. It's great to have our World of Water panel back in the house. Corey Chillibach, the CEO and founder of the Earth Group of Companies, including Earth Water, Andre Aslan, Executive Director of the Alberta Water Council, and Jay White uh, with Equality Environmental Consulting. I always like knowing Sarah Cameron's listening in on Twitter. She says, uh, my personal choice is tap water in a swell bottle. Uh, she says, however, uh, at Sarah's business, Fluid Hair, we do offer Earth Water. She says, I love nice. their company and I love what they're doing. Great work, guys. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, how many businesses 
places, what, what numbers can you give us in Edmonton and Alberta sure. that are carrying your water? We would be in, oh, we'd probably be in five or 600 uh, businesses in, in Edmonton, but we're right across the country. You know, every London Drugs, Safeway and Sobeys, um, you know, constantly picking up new customers. All the Ikeas across Canada, we're the only water in That's there. huge. Yeah, it's huge. They're an awesome company. They do some really great things. They're, our ideologies definitely align. Uh, we've grown, We've actually our company's doubled the last three years and we're, uh, yeah, hoping to. Is it tough for you to crack the, the, the businesses that are the Coke or the Pepsi businesses that have Dasani and Aquafina? It's our biggest challenge because, I mean, for instance, I went to school at the University of Alberta, and when I came up with the idea for the company, I, the whole concept was I was going to be able to sell bottles of water at the University of Alberta to help raise money for people who needed it. And as soon as I, you know, walked in there with my very first bottle of earth water, a naive kid, uh, you know, everybody's like, if you try to sell this here, you'll have lawyers following you around. Yeah, there's exclusivity contract. The city of Edmonton is a Coke city. You can't sell a bottle of earth water in any business, any, any swimming pool, any skating rink. I can't, you can't get in there. It's locked up. So a U.S. company owns the right to every city of Edmonton facility, which is crazy to me. So we have no access as a local Edmonton company to sell our product in our own city. You know? So it's wow. uh, it's pretty frustrating, but we spend every day trying to do but what we But you can. fight on. We fight on. There's no question. We have a close relationship with the city. We're always trying to do what we can to, to get in there and, and, and make headway. So. And you would G- think, just from a carbon footprint perspective, oh, yeah. they'd be very interested in dealing with you instead of bringing some water that's bottled God knows where. Oh, exactly. And I noticed you're drinking a Starbucks this morning. Yeah. Oh. And and well, I'm you're supposed why, to say that. Why they're why they're oh, bringing oh. why they're bringing in water from Fiji as opposed to oh, yeah, carrying yeah, your product. Is that also that also is something shipping that, water uh, from all over the world. I mean, yeah. our as much as bottled water is, isn't great for the environment, we bottle everything as close to the market as we can. So we bottle in three or four places in Canada, four or five places in Europe and Southeast Asia. You know, you know the bottles are you know 100 recycled plastic, which is great. And you know we can do things like work with the plastic bank. I don't know if you guys have heard of the plastic bank, but it's kind of a cool. Well, thing okay, too. water and plastic. L- yeah. Let's let's jump ahead to this conversation sure. right now. A study by Orb Media, State University of New York at Fredonia, made headlines uh, just last week for reporting that of 250 water bottles sourced from 11 brands in nine countries, 93% of the samples were contaminated with microplastics. Uh, Now, some of the bottles uh, showed 325 particles. We're talking about microplastics per liter. Some bottles tested featured concentrations up to 10,000 plastic pieces per liter. Yeah, shocking. It's um, definitely is changing everything. Everybody's thinking about it. Everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. I mean, that same same company did a, a test and found uh, you know eighty three percent of tap water also had microplastics in it as well. Again, neither of those tests were done in Canada, which is I guess a good sign. As um, soon as this came up, we obviously started talking with our manufacturers and our water sources, trying to you know get the test done. We don't use uh, we use only spring water, but you know this is a concern. Is it coming? They don't know where it's coming from. They don't know if it's coming from the water source or it's coming from the bottling of the actual bottle. Could so be the, you actually crack the cap and play pieces of plastic into sure. it. Sure. The CEO of the International mm-hmm. Bottled Water Association, predictably, mm-hmm. Joe Doss, says that it is a non-peer-reviewed study and that it aims to do nothing more than unnecessarily scare consumers. Mm-hmm. You think it'll change anything? I mean, it's. I mean, any information needs to be out there. We can't just like hide things. I mean, as a bottled water company, obviously this is troubling. Is it real? I'm not. I can't give you the hundred percent. We're trying to do the testing ourselves here because it's brand new. It's it's unconfirmed. Um, most of the big companies haven't even commented on it. In fact, I mean, I know some have done some testing and have found uh, microplastics in their po- in their in their product. I mean, we deliver tap water to everyone's house here in Edmonton via basically plastic pipes underground. Um, we you know we bottle in plastic. Where is it coming from? So we do need to. To look into it. We had to figure out where it's coming from. And we could it, talk all, all day, though, couldn't we, about the relationship between water and plastic? Mm-hmm. It's oh, not geez. just bottled water. It's no. not just microplastics. No. No. I mean, I was watching a video the other day of a scuba diver in Bali oh, yeah. underground diving beneath an orb of plastic waste. It was, plastic it was horrifying. Yeah, and this is, this is a, that plastic in the ocean is very serious. I mean, you, we've got to be doing stuff about that. And one of the things that's available is a, is a group out of Vancouver called the Plastic Bank, and we're working with them. So essentially, every time we make a plastic bottle, we you uh-huh use the plastic bank and they remove the equivalent of a bottle of plastic out of the ocean. So they're putting sea containers on the beaches Mm -hmm. in third world countries and they're actually paying people with food and building supplies to clean the water and clean the beaches, put them in these containers and then that plastic is recycled. So we're actually using that plastic that's being pulled out of the ocean to continue. We don't never have to buy plastic, raw plastic. There's so much plastic. We get ours from like the bottle depot. There's so much of it. Chip it down, make some new bottles and away you go. You never have to buy new. Cree Warrior is wondering how does an Aboriginal community partner with Earthwater? 
us a call. We'd love to talk to them. What's yep. the number? Yeah, just call. You know what? Email me. Your email is info at earthgroup.org. Info at earthgroup.org. Yep. Email me directly. <laughs> this text into 630-630 tees up the next question beautifully. It's just two words. Raw water? Oh, Anyone care to comment on <laughs> raw water, which is now available to consumers? Jeez, oh, raw water. My understanding of it is that it's a fad product that's trying to maximize the the efficiency of, of advertising. Really, it's a, it, it's a lifestyle sick, yeah. product. Um, you know, by raw water. This, my understanding is this is literally just water coming out of the ground that they put in bottles and sell you for like ten bucks a liter. Um, I don't have If we tried to do that, we would that. be shut down in a second. It's basically like taking a creek, yeah. creek with no testing, put it in a bottle and yeah. sell it for 10 bucks for 500 milliliters of it. Yeah. It's uh it's it's I hope it doesn't exist in in any stores here in Edmonton, but it might. I'm not sure. I haven't seen it here yet. I, I haven't coming. seen it yet, but yeah. uh, So is that a big no across the panel on raw water? No. Yeah, don't do Absolutely. that. Unless you're no. using it to wash your car. Yeah, use it, or, yeah. If, if you wash your Bentley with bottled water, go ahead and use raw water. Well, make sure you use earth water if you're going to buy that. <laughs> well, yeah, why not buy all that bottle of water to wash your Bentley. Let's do something good with it. Huh? Pay, pay for some meals yeah. for some kids yeah. halfway around the world. Just wasting it. All right, Jay, yeah. when we come still back. Wanna come back. You still want to go to, uh, to the car wash and do it, though. Don't yeah. do it in your driveway. Don't pour a bunch of soap down your... Yeah. Down your yeah. yeah. Right. We'll put whirling disease in front of Jay White, the expert uh, at Equality Environmental Consulting. Uh, Andre Aslan joining with Alberta Water Council and Corey Chillaback of Earth Group of Companies here on Jed. <laughs> It's our World of Water Roundtable with Jay White of Equality Environmental Consulting, Andre Aslan of Alberta Water Council, and Corey Chilibeck of Earth Group of Companies. The CFIA has declared the North Saskatchewan River and its watershed infected with whirling disease, which can be fatal to some types of young fish. The declaration includes the river upstream from Rocky Mountain House, plus all streams, creeks, lakes, and rivers feeding into the river. It ends at the Saskatchewan border. Jay, you're nodding your head going, tell me something I don't know. The province has known about this for quite some time, and we were waiting for the feds to do the official declaration, and that came out, I believe, on March 9th. So, yeah, all of the North Saskatchewan River, with the exception of the Battle River subwatershed, is now what we would call infected with whirling disease. So just like its counterparts in the Red Deer, just like its counterparts in the Bow system. So basically all the way up to the North Saskatchewan now, we have whirling disease. We don't have it further north from there. So the Athabasca and the Peace rivers are still uh, uninf- uninfected zones, but they're within the buffer. So the CFA has all sorts of rules about uh, moving sediment and fish around within those hydrological units that they that they measure. So it's not harmful to humans or other mammals. Uh, it, it, how devastating is it to the fish population? It can be very devastating. In the states, there were 80 to 90 percent losses of our cold water fishery. So mostly our trout, but also whitefish it affects. Our grayling here in Alberta, it affects bull trout. But we haven't seen those effects here in Alberta yet. We're not sure why. And some of the biologists assume that we've been living with this possibly now for maybe 20 years. Really? As long as 20 years. Is there anything that we can do to address? I mean, what causes it? It's a parasite that was introduced from fish stocking, so fish that were brought in from the UK or from the states that were infected and released here. And uh, basically, we just had poor uh, aquaculture practices of the day. And we were stocking ponds, small lakes uh, for recreational angling opportunities, and some food fish as well. So we've um, we've inspected all those facilities. We've decontaminated those facilities. The province has done a really good job of uh, inspecting those now. We've got sophisticated environmental DNA fingerprinting and testing for the disease now as well. And we're using researchers from the University of Alberta to chase where we have it. But the results continue to trickle in from the massive 
amount of studies that we performed last, or the province performed last fall when it was announced, and those results are still coming in. So I wouldn't be surprised if we found it in the Athabasca or Peace Systems, uh, but for now uh, we do have it in the North Saskatchewan, so clean, drain, dry. I'd, I'd like to direct everybody as part of World Water Day to go check out the clean, drain, dry messaging from Alberta Environment. Google whirling disease in Alberta and do your part, especially if you're a canoeist, you're an, an avid outdoors person, you're a construction person working in water, you're a fly fisherman, clean, drain, dry. Your what, do you, what do you mean by that? Just equipment. quickly. Uh, it's the provincial messaging. Andre, hop in. Right. So I'll, I'll plug that a little bit. So uh, uh, a few years ago, the threat of invasive mussels really became an issue. So these are mu- zebra mussels and quagga mussels. They're big in the Great Lakes. They were found about two years ago in Lake Winnipeg. So they are spreading west. Uh, aquatic invasive species, once you have them, they will spread. This is not a matter. Your best bet right now is to try to contain them, right? So Governor of Alberta came out with some messaging uh, called clean, drain, dry your boat. And then, so this is about making sure that when you're moving your boat, uh, particularly between water bodies, that you actually make sure you pull your plug out and that you drain all the water out of there because these zebra mussels are called villagers. Um, that's what makes them spread. And the same thing with uh, the whirling disease parasite. So basically, if you're clean, draining and drying your boat and you're pulling your plug, and I think there's actually legislation where if you get caught towing your boat with a plug in it, there's a big fine. Yeah. No. So the- are most people, like members of the public, compliant and cooperative? Do you find that most people want to contribute to a solution? Or are we selfish, generally speaking? Once you find out what the damage could possibly be, if you're someone who recreates on water, you you don't want to destroy that water body. You don't want to be the guy who introduced mussels into a water body and essentially killed it, right? So generally speaking, people are pretty understanding about it. There's mandatory watercraft inspection stations, 11 of them around the province at the highest risk areas to uh, make sure that we're catching boats that are coming in. My understanding is we've caught over 20 boats over the last couple years that have had live mussels on them. So the program is working uh, in terms of keeping mussels out, but once you get them, you're stuck with them, there's and they're only going to spread. There's at least a dozen boats a year that are intercepted, and we even had a kayak last year with zebra mussels on the kayak. But you might not, that's, here's the thing, if you're a kayaker, you might not even think of that, it might not even right. occur to you, But that's right? why there's signs at all the borders, mandatory watercraft inspection, yeah. thou shalt pull in. Sure. And so our border, border people have powers now to stop, and yeah. Fish and Wildlife staff have the powers to stop and inspect water. Canada watercraft. Border Services Agency, Solicitor General and Justice is involved. Uh, the irrigation districts originally sponsored uh, working with government in Montana to get sniffer dogs. So sniffer dogs is by far far the best way to, to sniff these guys out and find them. So, um, you know, one sniffer dog can sniff out five boats in the time. It can take a few humans to do it, um, you know, a single boat. So uh, good progress being made on the aquatic invasive species file. Part of the delay between finding out when we first suspected we had whirling disease and getting confirmation was that we had to, we had to send it off to a federal lab, right? Mm-hmm. And then so recently, uh, I think it was June last year, Governor of Alberta uh, set up a lab in Vegreville so that we can test our own water samples and do that much more quickly and sort of move and do the response piece, which is another big piece of aquatic invasive of timing. Uh, on the text line, listener wonders, what do these water guys think about the city flushing massive amounts of calcium chloride de-icer into the river? Ah, <clears throat> is that occurring? The river is terrible. I mean, our, well, they're, they're not, not flushing yeah. it. That's that's non-point source pollution. So, so we've got two kinds of pollutants that we deal with in surface water. You've got point source pollution, so anything that comes out of a pipe, which is very well regulated by the feds, by the province, under the Water Act, lots of different pieces of legislation that regulate that uh, Environmental Protection Enhancement Act. But then we've got non-point source pollution that we're not doing a good job with. So that stormwater runoff, that, uh, you know, the stuff that comes off your driveway and makes its way in through the drain systems, that does include the sand that we treat with calcium chloride that we put on our roads here. It's much different than the stuff we put on. I come from Ontario, and every car was a rust bucket in Ontario because we put salt on the roads. Here in Alberta, we put a brine solution on that's not salt. It's calcium, and that's a little bit more inert in the environment, so it's not having that the same sort of salinity effect that salt does particularly, and it doesn't, and of course, our cars don't rust as severely either, but we're also using you know, a 5% solution of calcium chloride versus a 90% solution of sodium. Mm-hmm. And the city of Edmonton's done a lot of uh, improvements in terms of its uh, managing its stormwater, especially the stuff that's coming off from downtown. So mm-hmm. it used to go straight into the river, and then there's been some, I think, wetlands deposition ponds that have been built to sort of capture some of that and bio bio. Yeah, the, the, a little the, bit. the beauty the beauty of Edmonton versus Calgary. Calgary's got hundreds of tiny stormwater outfalls. Edmonton, we've got four major ones that collect about ninety percent of our water. So we have four pipes essentially that we can treat and do a good job with. So Cannondale wetland treatment was. Uh, 
uh, one of the ones that yep. Equality helped develop. Fellas, we're going to run out of time, and I want to give you time to, to joke around about Gerald's question, which I'm sure is facetious, mm-hmm. wondering if he can drink the water in the St. Lawrence River in Quebec. <laughs> I, I suspect I know that your answer is fill your boots, but you might want to wear an adult diaper for a week or so after doing it. Uh, but I want to use our remaining minute to ask you about a statistic that, that you put in front of me through a commercial break I found quite striking. Uh, 30% of us here in the province, one out of three of us is getting our water from a well. Why does that matter? Why are we talking about that now through Canada Water Week? So much like the the, the position I just put out before about uh, uh, end of pipe being monitored, our groundwater wells and folks that are on groundwater wells, those aren't regulated. So basically, if you're getting your water out of a well, you're on your own to make sure that the quality of it is up to snuff. If you get it from your municipal source, you can trust that it's being treated and disinfected and delivered to you. Uh, healthily, but you're on your own. So we've got one third of Albertans that are on their own for their wells. So there's all sorts of ag water programs and other water programs. And Alberta Health will even check it for free, but there's something like 3% of the people that are on groundwater wells that actually get it checked. 3%? Yeah, really, like, terribly low numbers. Uh, if you're on a well, folks, look up the Working Well Program. Uh, look up uh, the Alberta Health Services Program for Drinking Water. They will take a sample of your water and they'll tell you whether or not it's safe, whether or not you need to do something else with it. And uh, don't forget to shock and chlorinate your wells to make sure the water's clean. Fellas, I'm already looking forward to the next time this panel convenes. Corey, uh, uh, completely Jet lagged. Yeah. Thank you for oh, joining exactly. us here in studio. Yeah. Welcome back to Home Soil. Appreciate Corey Chilliback, the Thank CEO you. and founder of the Earth Group of Companies. Andre Aslan, Executive Director of the Alberta Water Council. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you, Ryan. And Jay White, Principal of Quality Environmental Consulting. Thanks, Jay. Thank you very much. Chad Nation, we'll chat tomorrow. The Ryan Jesperson Show, weekday mornings at 9 on 630 Chad.